Hey guys, welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called The Kings of Israel by Funhill Games. It's for one to four players and it takes probably about an hour or so to play. Ages 12 and up. In the game Kings of Israel, you're basically going to be a prophet moving around trying to stop uh, locations from having sin in them. You'll be utilizing altars in which you'll make sacrifices on them to remove sin from that location that you have the altar and adjacent locations. And you'll be placing down altars as well, which if you can place enough of them down, depending on the number of players, you're going to win. However, sin spreads very, very quickly, especially in this area of the world, and every single round in which everybody has had their actions, sin is going to start going across the world spreading if any time all the sin gets placed and you need to place another and you can't or the golden calves get placed on the uh, areas and you can't place anymore the game is over you lose also every round you'll be moving down this track based on the year it is and the type of king that is reigning in israel and if at any point in time this little track with this little crown gets all the way down to the bottom of the track it says israel gets destroyed that's game over as well the only way is to remove sin by placing down those altars thusly securing israel from sin and preventing Israel from its destruction. Anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at the game and everything in included in it, and I'll let you know what I think about it in a review. This game is very much like Pandemic, for those of you who are already starting to think it is. Let's go ahead and show you the differences. So here we have Kings of Israel all set up for two players, and as you can see, I went and started with the merchant for one player and the musician for the other. You're also going to give each player two resources cards from the shuffled resources deck. These ability cards will also be shuffled too, so there's multiple different abilities and or characters that you can gain. Up to four players, so there's two additional players that are off the board, and then there's the false prophet, which is kind of an extra way of playing the game. Make sure you shuffle the resource, the blessing, and the sin and punishment deck, and then you're going to do the setup. The, each of the characters will have their own starting location location, like the uh, musician will be in Shiloh, and the merchant is going to start in Joppa. Uh, you're also going to take the location deck and deal out four cards, which is basically in a two-player game, two plus the number of players, and then uh, this one over here is going to be the number of players plus one, and this is just the number of players. And based on that, you're going to have, first of all, one sin cube on these four, two sin cubes on these two, three locations, and then for each of these locations, it'll give you a golden calf, and you'll place it on the board just as you see. All this stuff over here is basically uh, your pool of resources. After that, you're going to make sure you put these back, just in case you needed a reference, and you're going to take all of these locations and shuffle them back into the deck. Also, don't forget, if you ever during the setup draw a Shall Be Again card or any of the Nation Of cards, which are all of these spaces over here, make sure that you do not include them, set them aside, and then afterwards, shuffle the deck. Make sure you shuffle all of the locations up nice and neat, making it really, really easy. Uh, okay, and now put it aside so people can reach it. After that, make sure you have your little crown here set on Saul, the beginning of the game. And note that uh, there's certain kings that you're not going to be going on in a two-player game. So in the next round, you'll move to David, then Solomon, then Je Jeroboam, and then you're going to pass up Nadab and go to Basha. So we'll start with Saul here. Okay, now we're ready to begin the game. Everything is all set up. We have the calves. We've got these altars, which are what we need in the game. If we can get seven, we win for a two-player game. And these sin cubes are on all of these locations. If at any point all of the sin cubes have been placed on the board and one more needs to be placed down, we lose. And the same goes for the calves as well. These three little red cubes are basically signifying locations that get destroyed. If that happens, you're going to have that location gone and wiped from the board. There's reasons why that will happen. Usually it's in the sin and punishment deck. Okay, so let's begin. Let's look at the game turn order, and it shows you right here, which is very nice. There's the King's Godliness phase, which says you're going to, based on where this crown is, draw a card, and it's either be a blessing for the yellows, or it will be a sin and punishment for the reds. This is shown the unknown. Look at the top three location cards. Organize them in any way you'd like, and you can put them back on the bottom if you'd like. Bethel, Kadesh, and Mount Goboa. I'll just go ahead and leave those on the top there. But if I wanted, I could rearrange them and place them on the bottom. But I think these are actually good just where they are. After that is done, you've finished with your blessing. Remember, if it was a red one, you do sin and punishment. Then you're going to move on to the sin increases phase. But because we just started the game, we're going to ignore that, and I'll show you next round. Then the prophet's work phase. In turn order, starting with the starting player, that player is going to get four actions. And if you look at the other side of this board here, it'll tell you what you can do. For one action, you can simply move from one space to another. For another action, you can preach to the Israelites, which means if you're on a location with a sin on it, you can remove that sin. 
And then the next one is destroying an idol. If you happen to be on a uh, location with a golden idol, you can spend two actions to remove that idol from the game. You'll want to do that. Additionally, you can acquire resources. For every action you spend, you'll draw one resource card. And remember, you get the game starting with two. And there's a maximum hand size limit as well. I can't remember what it is. You have to look in the rules. After that, you can choose to build an altar as long as you have these certain resources. And I believe it's gold, wood, and stone. You can discard those cards into a discard pile and build an altar in your location. If you have an altar in your location and you happen to have wheat and calves or uh, cows, you'll be able to make a sacrifice, which means you'll discard those two cards and then any uh, sin in this area and one in each of the other areas will be removed with uh, the idol or, or the the, uh, <laughs> the altar around it. So that can help you getting rid of the nasty sin. And then the final thing is you can give resources. Giving resources means if you're on the same location as another player, you can spend an action to give one of your resources cards to the, uh, the player that you're currently on with. Those are the different actions. Let's go ahead and take a few right now just to show you how it works. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the musician who is on Shiloh to begin with. And the musician, once per uh, turn when you're moving, you can take a altar, if you're on one, and move it with you one time. One action to move, one action to preach and remove this sin, and then three and four to move back over here to start dealing with this stuff. This over here, the merchant, he's interesting. He gets more of a hand limit, and in addition, he can carry gold resources as wild. So any gold he has can be used as anything. He can spend one to move and spend two more to remove this idol. With one left, he moves up one more. After every single player has used their actions of four, then you're going to move on to the next stage of the game, which is going to be the end of round phase. You're going to pass the starting player token over here. You're going to move this down and make sure you pass up any ones that say that you should uh, pass them up. This is a three and four player game, so going on to David here. And then if you wanted, there is an easy mode thing which explains. Now going back to the king's godliness phase, this player is now going to draw another blessing card because it's yellow. And this one says you can choose a one other player to immediately draw another ability card. That's pretty sweet. So we're going to discard this card. And this player over here will just say that the merchant's nice and will let the musician have a new ability. That is imposing will, which says that new sin cubes will never appear on the location that you're at. So as far as this player goes, he will never acquire new sin cubes very uh, on the location. So if this one of these was Mount Ebal, it would not happen. Very, very useful, right? All right, we're done with the godliness phase. Let's go ahead and move on to the sin increases phase. We'll draw a number of location cards equal to the number of players plus one. So this should be three to two player game four and a three and so on and so forth. So we're going to start with the first one here, which says uh, this one's Bethel. So let's go ahead and look uh, down here for Bethel and I will place down a cube on it. Here we go right there. Next, we'll go on to the next location, which is going to be Kadesh. And once again, we got to find Kadesh somewhere on this board here and place another sin cube. And then our, our final location here is going to be Mount Gilboa. And mountain symbols are simulated with this little mountain, so we know it goes right there. After these are all done, put them in the discard pile. They are not going to come back in the deck until the card that is drawn that says shall be again. When that happens, you'll shuffle your discard pile and put it back on top of the deck, making it a little more challenging for players. Once that sin phase is done, we're going to go on to the Prophet's work phase and continue the game from there, moving around, pulling sin off of the board, creating altars. If you get those seven altars down, you'll win, utilizing resources, making sacrifices to keep the sin down. Solid, solid, solid. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about one other thing that's interesting. Whenever a location gets three sin cubes on it, a calf is going to go down. And then whenever a calf space gets sin on it, that, that, that space is going to spread sin. So for instance, if one Chinnereth card gets drawn, I would place one cube on here, making it three, putting a calf on it. And the next time Chinnereth gets played, you can actually put one cube on each of the spaces that it connects to. So that is how sin spreads and it can spread very quickly throughout the game. Another thing to note is over here we have port spaces, so you can travel from here to here and here all the way to here if you're on port locations, so you can get around the board a little easier. And also, if you draw one of these Nation of cards, like a Nation of Phoenixia, 
uh, up here, then you're going to place cubes based on the arrows. These spaces never get sin themselves. They, they get the sin and then they move it across the locations that are next to them. If that would happen, once again, three, this would be placed there. I think you get the idea of the game. You're trying to remove sin as best as you possibly can, placing altars down, removing the sin from the board, very similar in certain ways to a game most of you guys are aware of. Uh, let's go ahead and come up above and talk about what I think about this game and all the different aspects that make it, that set it apart from games you probably played that are similar to this game. So some caveats for the game Kings of Israel. First of all, like I said before, you need a stone, a wood, and a gold, and then you can make an altar, and you need a certain amount of altars to win the game. Once they're placed, that's it. You did it. Good job. But sin spreads quickly. An additional thing is gold, uh, sorry, grain and cattle. You can sacrifice both of these to make a sacrifice on a space with an idol. And if you do that, it'll remove all the sins on that space and from one from each adja adj adjacent space as well. Very, very useful. But it's going to cost you... One for each of these cards, one action for each of these cards, and then an additional action to sacrifice them. So you want to make sure you get at least three cubes for that deal. Maybe even four if you can. Uh, uh, another thing, too, is when you're playing easy mode, if you make a sacrifice on your turn, you can go ahead and draw a blessing card in addition to whatever card that you have to draw during the king's godliness phase. And I didn't talk about sin cards that much, other than the fact that you draw them when the kings get red, and they will get red, such as place an idol in both Bethel and Dan. So now you have two golden idols. Remember, if ever an idol needs to be placed and can't be game over, as well as sin. Uh, per, per, er, pursued on mountains. Players may not enter a mountain location this round. Any player on a mountain location must leave it as their first action. There's also one more I wanted to talk about as well that I thought was really, really interesting that I haven't seen happen. They're basically cards that will affect you later in the game. They're called foretold events. This is one of them here. It's called Holy Place Decay. A foretold event means you're going to be placing it down the deck in somewhere. I think it's like two cards down. And then you'll know it's coming. And when it comes, something bad happens if you don't deal with it. For instance, this one says, for each altar in Israel, uh, for each altar in Israel, either a single wood stone or gold card must be communally discarded by the, all the players, or else that altar is destroyed. So if there's five idols or five altars out, you will need to discard five of those type of cards, of any of those type of cards. And if you don't have a card for each of them, you're going to lose those altars, which is very, very, very bad. So remember to take care to acknowledge when the foretold events happen. And of course, there's a bunch of other nasty things that happen. The last thing to note is there's a false prophet. You want to include him in the game. He makes things a little more challenging because he moves around the table himself, spreading sin and idols and makes the game a little more interesting as well. This is very similar to Pandemic, as you guys probably have realized. It functions the same way as far as Plague and Sin goes, and you're basically going to be moving around the board, placing down things, which is what you need to do, and removing things, which is what you need to keep from losing. However, what are different in, what's different in this game as opposed to that one? Well, the way the locations work is different, as including the fact that there's those nation of things that produce more and more, uh, and as well as the fact that you're going to have these sin and punishment and blessing cards, and the foretold cards as well. Utilizing these throughout when the kings are good and when they're bad is really an interesting aspect, and the fact that you can play it in an easy mode, which lets you gain cards for sacrificing, thematically works, and it makes it easier for people who are a little bit younger. In addition, for the more complex aspect adding this little guy here. This game actually is more enjoyable, in my opinion, than the base game for Pandemic. Not only because I do appreciate the specific theme and the fact that there's not a lot of really good um, biblical-style board games out there. This is probably one of my favorites, if not my current favorite biblical board game because of how well it has been done. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. I like the fact that it shows all the different kings in order and whether or not they were the good kings or the evil kings based on the Bible. The fact that you'll be utilizing resources to do what they did in the Old Testament by sacrificing to, you know, condone for your sins and so on and so forth. And the fact that there's locations that uh, have to deal with sin. And, and there's, this starts off with Samaria has going to have one of these uh, altars there. And that makes sense as well. The different characters also work as far as how they function in the game. Merchants will be helpful as far as gathering more resources. And then the uh, the imposing will is going to prevent <laughs> Scott. I think this is Moses with the uh, or that mode, yeah, uh, what's his name with the tablets? And he's he's coming down. He's like, you'll never put sin on my location. I don't know. For whatever reason, though, this game is really, really solid. I really, really enjoyed it. I like all the component quality as well. It really works with the sins and the calves. The explosions happen as well, which is cool. If one location gets it has three sin and a cattle, that location will go boof. And if those locations have 
a, three, a, a, a cattle, then boof. So the game can ramp up. It's challenging, and you can make it even more challenging if you'd like. We've actually lost this game multiple times. We've played multiple times. My family is Christian, and uh, specifically my grandparents, which you've probably seen in other videos, perhaps, like Cheer Up, and she was really, really enjoying this game. My uncle also was watching us play it, and he said it was very accurate. So for those of you who are really interested in this type of theme, I think this is one you're going to dig. Pandemic lovers as well, if you want something that's a little different with a unique little twist and a different type of theme, for those of you who go to church, this is definitely one of those games. I was always looking for good games for the church I went to, uh, to have the kids play it and whatnot, and I found a couple of them, they were like Noah's Journey and stuff, and uh, they wasn't it wasn't very, they weren't very good, you know, they were just kind of like whatever with the, the theme attached to it. I wanted a game that actually made you think and then gave you the ability to learn about this and have a story based on what you're doing throughout the time. You can actually teach a lesson with this game while playing it. Overall, a very solid little game. If you're tired of Pandemic, however, this is not going to change your mind in my opinion. If you don't want to play a game that's like Pandemic, this is pro there's not enough here to where I think you'd be like, oh, well, this is definitely, I, I've, I'm mind blown now over it. But if you haven't played Pandemic yet, or if you're somebody who wants this type of theme and wants to teach it to other people, specifically uh, people who are very interested in the biblical aspects of this game, you're going to dig this game. I really had a lot of fun with it. I'm excited to donate to, to my grandparents' church after I finish this so that they can have more and more people play really good board games. All right, that's what I got. I will see you guys next time when we defeat the sin in Israel. Because that's what... That's what that's, a, that's the game. That's what we do in this game.